It's just awesome how we can enjoy fellowship. Last night was a lot of fun. And uh, the answer to that question, the guys actually won that one. The women tried to guess things were trying to change, clothes, you know, that type of thing. But the one they left out was the one that the men got and kind of stole that thing, attitude. (laughs) Trying to change your husband's attitude. I didn't understand it. But some of the guys got it, and it was good for them. (laughs) Well, welcome this morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, It's always wonderful to sing his praises. It's wonderful to get into the word of God, and it's always wonderful to hear what God is doing in each other's lives and just being able to come alongside and just uh, bring some measure of encouragement to each other. You know, the Bible talks about us doing that more so as we see the day of Christ approaching, uh, drawing near. And so I think it's uh, one of those things that we want to emphasize. We want to encourage each other. And I, I, I don't... Um, uh, I wasn't saying it uh, in a kidding way, but I encourage you to invite each, over, each other over and, and have times of fellowship among ourselves. It's important that we do that, isn't it? Well, this morning we're in 1 Thessalonians, and I ask you to turn your Bible to 1 Thessalonians, and if you have a need for a Bible, these fine gentlemen would love to give you one. If you don't have one at all, please feel free to take this one that you um, are able to get from faith here this morning, take it home with you, and allow it to be uh, uh, your Bible that you can read. I am always, and I, I say this all the time, and I, and I realize it, but it's just the true statement. I'm always amazed at God's word. And I'm always amazed that as we go to these passages of scripture, how God's word just really jumps off the pages and really gives to us uh, something of great substance to think through. Uh, the title of the message this morning is The Key to Spiritual Success. And I recognize the fact that in our lives, in our world, we are encountering the secret for something in all different venues of life. And people do it as a marketing strategy, don't they? They seek to tell us how we can get that magic pill that will somehow take off the magic 40 pounds that we've accumulated. Uh, we see commercials on TV for weightlifting equipment, and we see these guys, and, and you could play checkers on their abs, you know, and, and they tell us that if you just buy this and, and, and put this in your basement and, and work out, this is what I love, work out 30 minutes a day, three times a week. Like 90 minutes is going to make me look like that guy. <laughs> that guy, I guarantee you, is working out every day for four or five hours, guarantee you. You see, the reality is, however, as we come to this passage of Scripture, that I really do believe that I can deliver on the topic of the key to our spiritual success because I believe it is right here on the pages before us, and I think that the hype can be substantiated. So as we go to scripture this morning, let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask him just to bless our time together. Father God, we thank you so much for bringing us together today. We thank you, Father, for the testimonies that we've heard, for the songs that have been sung, for the blessings of knowing, Lord, that you are at work here in our lives. Give to us, Lord, an understanding now as we come to the word of God. Help us, Father, to to grasp the significance of what was happening in Thessalonica. And help us, Father, to be able to understand it in such a way that it impacts our lives today now, that we might be truly like these who've gone on before us, truly excited about your working in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that now you just open our hearts and minds that we might understand the scripture on this subject. We pray it all in Christ's name, amen. In Thessalonians, if you go back to chapter one, you see that the apostle Paul in verse two is always uh, thankful, he says, for the work that's been done in the hearts of these people. He says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Come over here to chapter two. We pick this up in verse 13. He says, for this reason, we also thank God 
without ceasing because, and he goes in and he begins to list it. I see the Apostle Paul as someone who's really excited about what God has been doing in Thessalonica. He is over the top excited about that. And he finds himself perpetually giving thanks to God for doing the work in their heart and lives. And he is just absolutely blessed by all of this, so much so that as he gives thanks, and he says here in chapter two, verse 13, that he's giving thanks constantly, that his thanks goes to God for the great things he does. Now we're gonna skip down to verse 19 before we get back to verse 13. So our text this morning is 13 through 20. But Paul is going to say in verse 19, for what is, and he asks this question, what is our hope or our joy or our crown of rejoicing? What is our hope? And he goes on to say, because it's a rhetorical question, it is even you. He said, it's you. And we're going to be giving this joy and this rejoicing in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. So three things about these people, very quickly, they were his hope. Remember, the biblical sense of hope is not as the English usage of the word hope, which means, you know, pie in the sky, hope. It's uh, confidence that you have in a future event. Paul would look at these people and he says, I'm confident that you will not let me down in that day that is yet coming. He makes the mention of joy. You know, joy is looking forward in Paul's mind to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When, as we're gonna find out later in chapter four, could come at any time. And the last thing he says there is, you are our crown of rejoicing. Crown of rejoicing. He's talking here about the victor's crown. In the Greek games, as men would compete, they would go out and they would run races and they would do various events and the winner would be crowned with a laurel wreath upon his head. And he would stand out from the others because he had this crown of achievement. Paul looks at these people and he says, you are my hope, you are my joy, and you are my crown of rejoicing. Paul speaks here of a soul winner's crown. And he thinks about the day in the future when Jesus Christ will return. In fact, if you look at this passage closely, you'll see here that Paul mentions for the first time the coming of Christ. He mentions that there in verse 19. Is it not even you, you Thessalonians? He says, it is you who are my hope, my joy, my crown of rejoicing in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. Parousia. It's the first time that the Apostle Paul uses the word parousia. You may remember from our study in 1 John that John liked to use that word parousia, speaking of the coming of Jesus Christ. You see, at the coming of Christ, which could take place at any time, there will be followed by that, as we know, seven years of tribulation upon the earth, which is really a focal point of judgment coming upon the people of Israel. But for us, the church, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. And one of the things that we'll enjoy there in the presence of the Lord is the marriage supper of the Lamb, which I just can't wait for that. I mean, the moment I put my faith in Jesus, I got a ticket in the mail for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm looking forward to that event. But even before the marriage supper of the Lamb, there's something called the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat of Christ. And we think of the word judgment, we think of, oh no, this is gonna be terrible. But I want you to think of it in the sense that it is a time of great rewards where God measures up and says, this is your reward. And when I'm standing there and when you're standing there, you must understand along with me that we are not going to have anything but ourselves standing before the Lord. See, it's all about people, Paul is saying. When I think of my joy, and the Apostle Paul, I'm thinking, man, wouldn't you love to be the Apostle Paul? I'd love to be standing in his sandals at that day. Wouldn't you? But Paul doesn't look at any of those things. He looks at the people, people that might be standing next to him. 
People who will be standing there. And he says, when I'm standing there at the coming of the Lord Jesus, when, when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes for us and, and we're there in heaven caught up together with him into the heavenlies, he says, when I'm standing there, my friends, listen, you are my joy. You are my crown of rejoicing. It's people who will be at the be a seat of Christ. It's people. I'm not going to get there and, and, and say, oh, Lord, you know, we did great things in your name. We built buildings, and we did this, and, and we did that. You're, you're not going to get there with your house or your car. You're not going to get there even with your stack of holy Bibles. You're going to be standing there, and the only thing that's going to be before the Lord is people. Will you be responsible for having led someone to Christ, shared the good news of the gospel with someone? Because if you'd have, you could turn as well and say, you are truly my joy, my crown of rejoicing. Oh, that God would give us hearts for other people, that we might stand there before the Lord, and as the Apostle Paul looks forward to rejoicing, that we could be rejoicing as well, amen? What a blessing. Paul looks at these people and he recognizes God is doing some pretty amazing things with these folks. We found out last week when we were going through this passage preceding this one that the people there in Thessalonica had been sounding forth the gospel to Asia and Macedonia and all over the place. They were getting a really good reputation and it was exciting to see what God was doing. But you have to ask yourself, what's the key to their spiritual success. What makes them? So godly, able to push forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. What, what is the key? There must be something to this. And as I'm looking at this passage, I draw your attention to verse 13. Because I believe here in verse 13, you will see what the key truly is to spiritual growth. Now, I'd love to be able to tell you that there was a spiritual pill that was being marketed at all the Christian bookstores around the country. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be an easy way to get to the point that we want to find ourselves in. Or, or I could give you a little devotional. If you'd only read one paragraph for the rest of your life, you know, of something that's talking about nice things, maybe then you'd be able to be what God wants you to be. You see, the spiritual success comes here as it's listed here in verse 13. Paul says, I'm constantly giving thanks to you because, here's the reason, when you receive the word of God, and he's speaking here, receive the word of God from, and he's thinking of himself, and he's thinking of Silas, for instance, and Timothy who were with him. You receive the word of God which you heard from us, and when you received it, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. He was able to say that these people separated out the understanding of the word. The word was, without a doubt, not the words of men. Now, if you think back to Acts chapter 17 with me, you remember that's the passage that speaks to the whole issue of the Apostle Paul when he first arrives there in Thessalonica coming from Philippi. And you may recall that when the Jews ran him out of town, he went to another town, Acts chapter 17 talks about, as the city of Berea. And I think it's the old King James that said the Bereans were more noble-minded than those who were in Thessalonica. New King James uses the word fair-minded. But the truth of the matter is you had these Bereans who are noted because they eagerly received the word and they searched the scriptures. See, they didn't just take Paul's word for it. They said, we're going to search the scriptures. We're going to look this up for ourselves. We're, we're going to get in the Old Testament, find out if that's really what it says. But the Thessalonians, do you see this here? They took the words and realized that the words that they were hearing were not the words of men, but in truth, the word of God. With a simplicity, they laid hold of the word of God. Now, one of the keys to our spiritual success has to be our understanding of the word of God. The first thing they did was they embraced the word 
of God. So let me ask you a very important question. What place does this book have in your life? What place does it have in your life? How important is it? Well, the importance or the significance of this, the Bible, will be for you based based upon your understanding of what it truly is. I understand that if I asked this question and I said, how many of you think that the Bible is God's word? Probably most of you would raise your hand, if not all. So let's just dismiss that already. That's not what this is all about. What this is all about is understanding how significant is it? Do you and I really look at the Bible and say, this is supernaturally given revelation of God to us. You realize most people have a Bible in their home? There's some statistics for you, just a few statistics. Most people still come to the Bible to find intimacy with God, but increasingly more people come looking for answers to life's questions. And 64% in 2011 said that the Bible uh, brings me closer to God. It's dropped a little bit in a few years, and maybe that's within the margin of error, as it were. Another one here, the Bible is uh, going to bring me comfort, and that actually went up. Again, probably within that margin of error, but that's the percentage of people that uh, currently think that the Bible holds some answers for them. Here's some other statistics. People are less likely to view the Bible as sacred. In 2011, it was 86%. 2014, 79%. Notice Bible ownership remains strong. 88% of Bibles uh, or people, uh, homes, households, have a Bible. So somewhere there's access to the scriptures available. The average number of Bibles in your house, 4.7. How many of you have more than 4.7 Bibles in your house? (laughs) Yeah, so we probably account for like 80%, right? (laughs) 37% of Americans read it once a week, 37% read the Bible once a week. That means most people don't ever read the Bible. You realize that most people, I can make this statement, most people in churches just like this one will read the Bible if the pastor puts it up on the screen on Sunday morning and not read it again until the next Sunday. That might be you. How much of God's word did you read this past week? 56% of Americans are pro-Bible. That's a good thing, right? That is, that's truly a good thing. But these people here in Thessalonian that we're reading about here in chapter two embraced the word of God and the word of God was so significant to them that it really wouldn't do, I think it's fair to say, to go through a week and not read their Bible. See, they were passionate about God's word. How we view the word of God is truly, I believe, the key to spiritual success. Are you with me? They didn't receive it as the word of man. There it is. It's God's word. It's got a beautiful leather cover, and it sits on your shelf all week long. And you put it in the same place, so when you go to church the next week, you know where to find it. Or maybe it's rattling around in the backseat of your Chevrolet and you have to go ripping through stuff to find it on Sunday morning. Your regard for this book, it is possible to know here that it is truly the word of God, but treat it like it's the words of men. You see, if it's the word of men, it could be still worth reading. I like to read the words of men. Do you like to read the words of men? I enjoy that. You might be able to get Spurgeon's greatest quotes or Vance Havner's greatest quotes. I love reading those, but they're the words of men. Are they worth my time? Certainly. Would I read it every day? Absolutely not. But you see, this book is different than all the rest of books. This book is the divinely inspired word of God. And it blows everything out of the water. I have to confess to you, I've told you before, I don't like to overthink things. 
In fact, I don't even like to think too deeply about most stuff. If I was gonna live in one of those two towns, Berea or Thessalonica, I would live in Thessalonica. I would wanna go to church with those guys. You know why? Because as simple as it sounds, if it's God's word, I'm good with it. I don't even need to go and search it out to see if it's really true. You see, if it was God's word, I'd be like, wow, okay. It's almost like a simple faith on their part. They took the words and they recognized in truth as the word of God says, it was in truth the word of God and so they did the right thing in following it. Now there's nothing wrong, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with being passionate about studying God's word. I do it every week. I dig through the Old Testament, dig through the New Testament trying to, to understand what it is and, and I encourage you to do the same thing. But I don't come to God's word as a skeptic. I come to God's word knowing and understanding that it is truly 100% divinely inspired. As I come to God's word, I have over the years become passionate about the word of God. Some things are forced in life, like working out. It's hard for me to work out. How many of you love to work out? You just love to work out. Ooh, now that's interesting. Yeah, raise, raise, raise and I'll tell you why. Mm, interesting. You guys need to start going to the first service. I don't know, so there's something happening with the first service people because there was a whole bunch of them that love working out. And you guys are like loving sleeping in and coming to the second service and maybe hitting IHOP on the way in. I, I, I see it, I see it, yeah, yeah. Is it like the hardest thing in the world to go work out or what? You know, it's like, you know, I have to trick myself into to working out. You know, like I put a bowl of ice cream on the elliptical machine and <laughs> the only place I can eat it is right there, you know. I mean, I'm not that bad, believe me. But, but there are certain things that we need motivation for. And, and here is this, this church. And, and the reason why they're broadcasting the gospel all over the world is because of their passion for God's word. And, and it isn't like they have to be, be overly urged to do this. They, they're drawn to the word of God, and, and you want to know why? Sure you do. Here it is. They received the word of God as it was the word of God, and the proof to them comes later there in verse 13. They come to this as he says, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also, I want you to see that, effectively works and you who believe. The word of God, as I mentioned before, is different than any other book you'll ever read. The word there effectively works is the word where we get the English word energy from. In other words, there is something about this book that stands apart from all the other books of the world. And what happens is as you go down into the word of God, it begins to do something in your life. There's a working that begins to take place. The writer of Hebrews 4, 12, great verse of scripture for the word of God is, depending on your version, <laughs> quick, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing through, able to be the divider of intents and thoughts of the heart. This is the word of God, folks, that's able to get down into the very crux of who you are. And the Holy Spirit can take the word of God and he can do something nothing else can do. So as you come to the word of God and you say, God, I just, I just wanna know you. I, I always think of the, the desire of Moses. God, let me see your glory. He just wanted to see the glory of God. He wanted to know God better. And this is the desire of Christians who are growing. I wanna know God more. I wanna delve into this holy word and I wanna allow the spirit of God to, to meet me really right down where I am, who I am. And understand that the word of God is powerful and it will do a work in your life. So why isn't God's word more effective in our lives? You see, for many people, God's word is absent. For many people, they look at God's word as being the words of man. 
They're not serious about it. They're not passionate about it. There was an article written and it came through the Fox News wire not too long ago talking about the biblical illiteracy of people, which on Fox News was just kind of a weird place for this to pop up. But it had gone through and it had done a study to find out what did people know about the Bible. My friends, listen. Since I've been alive, there's never been a worse time in America when it comes to biblical illiteracy than it is today. If we were to do a quiz among many churches in America, we would be aghast at how little people really know, which speaks to the issue of how little time we really spend in God's word. You see, the reason why I'm so excited about God's word, and and I stand up here on Sunday mornings, there's there's not a week goes by that when I don't stand up in front of you, I'm excited about that passage that we're going to get into. Because the Bible is so rich, and I've seen the word of God work in people's lives, and I've seen it work in my life. God's word transforms us. That's what happened to a whole bunch of pagan idol worshipers in a city known as Thessaloniki that were absolutely non-godly minded. And what God did was he brought the gospel to them and he transformed their mind and heart. Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. He's transformed us. He's changed us. This is what God's word does. Now, I don't know about you, but I need transforming and changing. Have since 1964 when I placed my faith in Jesus, and I still need it. Oh, Lord, you know I need it. And so I come to God's word on a daily basis, not because I'm driven to, not because I'm in, in, in an accountability group so that we can challenge each other, get on the right page and get into the word of God. I, I get into the word of God because I recognize it transforms, that has this power, and I'm excited about it. There's nothing else in my kitchen that's as nice as the word of God. There's nothing in my library that's more profound than the word of God. I I have hundreds of books that are written about the Bible. And when I get up, I want to get the Bible out. Because it's the one that transforms. Are you passionate about God's word? This is the key to spiritual success. Now Paul's going to go into this and he's going to say, listen, because they had some questions in their mind. If you're gonna be a follower of me, Jesus would say, you're going to be persecuted. Jesus made that very, very clear. And Paul does the same thing to these folks because I'm sure they're asking themselves the similar question. If, if all of a sudden I'm delving into God's word and it's changing me, shouldn't life get easier? Shouldn't my problems seem to melt away? I mean, after all, I'm doing God's will here. You mean you haven't experienced that, huh? You say, yeah, Pastor Kevin, every time I read my Bible for a whole week straight, I just never have any problems. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Paul says in verse 14, for you brethren became imitators of the churches of God. Remember he had talked about them being imitators of, of Paul as he is of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, you've become imitators of the churches of God and he's talking about this in a, a slightly negative way in the sense that these churches of God in Judea, as he mentions, were churches that underwent tremendous persecution and now you're just imitating the same thing that happened with them. He says, for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did the Judeans, who killed, and he makes it very clear, these Judeans, these people in the synagogues where you would meet, they're going to tell you that you're off track. They're going to say you're off beat, and there are problems in your life. But understand this, that these people who are persecuting you were also the same people who killed both the Lord Jesus, verse 15, and their own prof- and the prophets that God had sent, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men. They're forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. Sin as always, or so as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. 
You see, when you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, understand this, that there will be times as you get closer to the Lord and your life changes that the world doesn't respond with kindness. The one thing that the world hates is someone who is walking as Jesus walked. They didn't like Jesus. They hated his attitude. They didn't like his miracles particularly. They didn't like anything about him. The prophets that came before him, they harshly treated and they put them to death. Jesus would give the parable of the vine dresser and he would say there was a harvest time and he sent his servants and the servants, instead of being given the money from the harvest, were killed. And ultimately, Jesus' parable would go on to say that the, the landowner of the vineyard would send his own son and certainly they would not harm him, but that is exactly what did happen. They killed him too. And he's speaking obviously about himself and he was speaking there of the prophets who preceded him. When you walk with Jesus and you let the word of God change your life, you can expect there's going to be resistance. But here's an amazing thing and there's just so much here that's to me uh, uh, it's just pretty, pretty amazing is that as these people go through this, he's going to write here and he says, In verse 16, so as always to fill up their measure of their sins. I I find that interesting because the Hebrew image here is of a measuring cup that's being filled up. And every fresh act of hostility toward the gospel was another drop in that cup, another drop of guilt in that cup, which had been steadily filling up for the ages. And God says, his wrath is going to come upon them to the uttermost. Remembering that that seven year period of tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's actually a time where God pours his wrath out upon his own chosen people for all the evil that they have done. Ultimately, we rejoice that God's people will turn their hearts to the Lord at the end of that period of time, but not until there's great judgment that's brought upon them. You see, there would be opposition For those who would walk according to God's word, there will be opposition. In fact, the apostle not only identifies these who would oppose it, but he also identifies Satan who is in opposition. In verse 18, he says, therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. The desire, according to verse 17, that Paul had to come to these people was profound, and his language is really profound here too. You see that in verse 17 where he says, but we brethren having been taken away, it's actually the word uh, for for ripping someone away, it's a a word that's used of bereavement when someone's died, how, how terrible we feel because they've been taken away from our world. Paul says we were that way, we felt that way, we'd just been ripped away. And our heart and our desire was to be there. We, we endeavored more eagerly. We had a tremendous drive to be with you. I, I can only imagine the Apostle Paul. Can you imagine? I mean, Paul's whole life is about these churches, right? And seeing people come to Christ. Here he is. He plants the seed of the gospel there in Thessalonians, uh, to Thessalonica. And the, the, the gospel is sprouting up and bearing all this fruit. And he can't get there. Have you ever been someplace where you really wanted to be and you couldn't be there? I mean, like, this is unbelievable. And you just can't be there. That's Paul. And he recognizes that Satan has hindered him. The word hindered there means to cut up, literally. It was a a Greek term that was used for the militaries, uh, cutting up of a road, making passageway for the enemy impassable on that road so that they'd have to take another route. You see, Satan was blocking Paul's advance to come to Thessalonica. As I looked at that, I thought, Here's something really amazing. Wouldn't it have been fantastic for Paul to get to Thessalonica and begin to exclaim some of these truths and and the profound teachings of God's word? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't these people really be able to grow in their faith and wouldn't they really be helped? But they already were. You see, it all came back, not to the apostle Paul, and let me just say this, we can all be replaced, can't we? You see, it came back to the power of the word of God because the word of God is sufficient to mature us and give us everything that we need. 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for rebuke and correction, instruction and righteousness. That the man of God may be mature, complete in all good works. You see, this Bible that you and I have is so profound that it alone can change lives. It alone speaks to the issues of our heart. How wonderful it is for us to take the word of God and make it as precious as it needs to be. That we would be passionate about it, that we would embrace it, not as the words of men, but truly as it is the word of God. Because that is the key to spiritual success, is the word of God elevated to that point in your life? That's the big question for all of us, isn't it? How significant is is God's word? How, How important is it? We need to see the statistics go up. We, we want to be able to say, you know, it is so important that I would direct my life towards it, that I would read it every day, not because I'm being forced to, but because I am excited about what the potential is for God to move and change in my life. Would you take a high view of the word of God? Or would you treat it And I know you don't believe that it's just the words of men, but would you treat it like it's the word of men? Treat it like it's the word of men. We used to get newspapers. Remember back in the day? People actually throw them in your yard. Remember that? We had paper boys. You know, I mean, not many people read the paper anymore. I mean, I I know you get the the Thanksgiving thing, right, with all the ads in it, right? You got to have that one. But I can remember being challenged because I used to love to get the paper. Even as a little kid, I used to love to get the paper. Um, 10, 11 years old. First thing I'd do, get up in the morning, I'd run down the end of the driveway and grab the newspaper and see what place the Red Sox were in. <laughs> sometimes it wasn't pretty. Most of the time it wasn't pretty. All the time it wasn't pretty. Newspapers. I used to read those newspapers. I used to think to myself, you know, it's the word of men. How much stuff do we read on the internet that's a word of men? We turn on the TV and we learn about stuff that's the words of men. We're all about the words of men. This is the word of God. Let's pray. This morning as we Humble our hearts before the Lord. In a moment, I'll have a word of prayer, but I wonder if I could incorporate into my prayer this morning a prayer for you. Might I be able to pray for you? Might I be able to pray that God would do a work in your life? Maybe you're here this morning and God's speaking to your heart about where you're gonna spend your eternity. See, this is the whole reason that Jesus Christ came. That was the reason why why Paul went to the Thessalonican people. He wanted them to know about Jesus. He wanted them to know that he had made this sacrifice on the cross and their faith in him would save them from their sin and give them eternal life. Maybe you're here and you've never made that decision to put your faith in Jesus. If you never have, there's no greater time than now to do that. Would you bow your head just now and pray that prayer if you've never prayed it before, placing your faith in Jesus? Perhaps you're here today and you say, Pastor Kevin, I know that I have done this. I've I've prayed this prayer in the past, but God's word has spoken to my heart today about elevating its place in my life. Maybe you'd say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I need to give more esteem to the word of God. I need to be passionate about it as I am of other things. You say, Pastor, pray for me. Would you just slip up your hand that I might include you in prayer today? Amen. Amen. Many of us today. Are you here today and you've put your faith in Jesus? Could I pray for you as well? Just slip up your hand. 
Say, Pastor, pray for me. Today I've put my faith in Jesus, or maybe you'd say this morning I'm, I'm wanting to call upon his name. Thank you. God is able to do great things through his word, is he not? Would you all stand with me as we have a word of prayer together today? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the work you do in our hearts through the word of God. How amazed I am by your word. How amazed I am at your ability to look deeply into my heart and show me the areas of my life that are offensive to you, Lord. Father, I normally would like to look past them, forget them, treat them as if they're not that big of a deal, but Lord, I know that when I open your word, the Spirit of God does something rich in my heart. Help us, Father, to all be passionate about you. May you bless, especially these, Father, who have asked for prayer. Lord, I know you're working in their heart today, and I pray that you would carry through that work in their life, that the word of God would truly be something that they're passionate about. Father, help us as your followers to love you more. Work in the hearts of those who've asked for prayer today because today they want to call upon your name. Such a blessing, such a joy. That you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance of sins and know you. Father, we rejoice in that desire of yours for we wouldn't be standing here without it. So bless us this week, Lord. I pray that wherever our feet take us, that we would take as ambassadors of Christ the testimony of our Savior, that we might bring glory to your name, for there's no other name given on earth that matches the name of our Jesus. Bless us, Lord, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.